Hello everyone, my name is Captain Barrington Irving and my office is at 45,000 feet. <laughs> Didn't start off that way. So I was born in Kingston, Jamaica. Yes. Moved to Miami at the age of six. Came from very humble beginnings. And to be quite honest, I grew up in two of the three worst neighborhoods in Miami. Now, while growing up, I was a talented athlete, and I played American football. I played fullback and linebacker, had a number of scholarships to attend, multiple universities, and our football team was ranked third in the nation and went on to be ranked number one in the nation. Football was everything to me. That's all I thought about, and honestly, all I cared about, until one day I was in a store minding my own business, and I met this gentleman. Captain Gary Robinson. He walked in, dressed in a pilot's uniform, and I looked at him. And he saw that I was looking at him, and he walked over to me and said, hey son, have you ever thought about becoming a pilot? <laughs> My first words to him was, I don't think I'm smart enough to fly an airplane. How sad is that? Captain Robinson did not know I grew up less than two miles from an airport and never once thought that I would be smart enough to fly an airplane. Being an inner city kid, I asked one pivotal question. How much money do you make? <laughs> After he answered that question, I took an interest in aviation. <laughs> interest turned into passion. And of course, when it came time to announce which collegiate team I will continue my athletic career with, I decided to turn down all of my scholarships and said I wanted to become a pilot. When I made that decision, my friends couldn't believe what I chose, and my coaches thought something was wrong with me. <laughs> However, there was one person in my school, my former high school teacher, Ms. Batiste. When I was in school, I absolutely used to hate this woman. She was the one person who had high expectations for all of us as students. And when I turned on my scholarship, Ms. Batiste said, Barrington, you made the right decision. Now this teacher, on her own, going from door to door, fundraised close to $20,000, and that is the power of a teacher in a classroom. So my mentor, Captain Robinson, one day said, son, I'm proud of you. You want to become a pilot, but I want you to do one thing. And I said, well, what do you mean, Mr. Robinson? He said, I want you to give back. And my response to him was, well, I don't have any money to give. How could I possibly give back? And he said, no, you don't understand. I want you to share knowledge and communicate your experiences with other young people. Captain Robinson got me thinking, and I said to myself, what's one way, whether I lived or died, I could try to inspire other young people? Because where I grew up, I didn't have a long expectation for my life. And then it hit me, and I said, well, what if I flew around the world? The thought of it sounded great. <laughs> but for two and a half years, people told me no. I said, there's no way you're going to be able to fly around the world. The youngest person to fly around the world before me was 37 years of age. They said, you don't have the money, you don't have the experience, it's not going to happen. So I then decided to take my one pair of dress shoes. Okay, let me be honest, these were my church shoes. That became my marketing shoes and my networking shoes. And I wore these shoes tirelessly. You'll see in the image, I have three nice, beautiful holes in the bottom of them. And I wore these shoes tirelessly at aviation conventions and shows trying to get people to buy into flying around the world in order to inspire other young people to dream of possibility. Well, what's the first thing you need in order to fly around the world? An airplane. The aircraft I utilize cost $650,000. I can find anyone 
to let me borrow one, <laughs> lease one, rent one, nothing. And then I remember I was frustrated and I was sitting on the floor in my room. And although I was never a part of this in my community, what's one thing a professional thief does when they steal a car? They chop it. For those of you who do not understand that expression, <laughs> what chopping means is that they, take, they steal the car, they take all the parts, and then they sell them into different markets. Then it hit me. Just because one aircraft manufacturer has their logo on the airplane, does that mean they make all the parts? No. I just didn't know the professional term, which is called original equipment manufacturers. <laughs> I studied each and every single manufacturer, what, they, what part they manufactured, and I decided to go after the engine first because that was the greatest risk. And I drove 12 hours from Miami to Mobile, Alabama, with only enough money to rent a car and sleep in that car. <laughs> Figured out a way to introduce myself to the company, and then acted as if I knew who the CEO of the company was. <laughs> Finally have a chance to meet the CEO. He realized I did not meet him ever before in his life. <laughs> and he said, you got five minutes shoot. Within those five minutes, I was honest with him and I explained who I was and where I came from. He simply said, thank you for coming. <laughs> Received a phone call a few weeks later to my surprise. It was that same CEO, Brian. And he said, if you had the guts to find me, I believe you'll find yourself around the world. And he sponsored me an engine worth $83,000 right there on the spot. I was able to get other parts donated, cut the cost of the airplane, and began to partake in flying around the world. Now, it was very challenging. On the right-hand side, you see an image of me. Imagine sitting that way for as long as 12 to 13 hours at a time. My aircraft had no weather radar, as well as no de-icing. This is an interesting picture. Anyone notice anything weird about this picture? I'm sitting on a horse instead of a camel. <laughs> now, why am I sitting on a horse instead of a camel? Well, I asked a group of elementary school students this a few months ago, and a young man in the back of the classroom raised his hand, and he said, sir, I know why you're on, on a horse instead of a camel. And I said, tell me why. He said, sir, that's what Americans do. <laughs> I said, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. The reason why I was sitting on a horse instead of a camel is because when I departed to fly around the world, I only had $30 in my pocket. No one knew this, but I knew although I had a plan, I needed a strategy. And the strategy was this. The moment I departed out of Miami without asking anyone for financial support, people would begin to believe in the dream and support me and contribute. Of course, the further I kept on going, the more I had to be frugal, and that's why I'm on the horse instead of the camel. <laughs> Flying around the world took me 97 days, 145 flight hours. I made 27 stops in 13 countries. One of the greatest things that happened in flying around the world outside of surviving the trip <laughs> and setting a Guinness World Record was that we had over 300,000 students who followed a simple blog that we were using to just share how I felt during the trip. When I realized that I was inspiring young people, although I had a number of job offers to fly professionally, whether for the airlines or for celebrities, I decided that I wanted to empower them. These students reminded me of who I was a few years earlier. Math and science, to me, did not have a purpose until I met Mr. Robinson. And I wanted to find out, well, how could we address this? In this image is an airplane built by 60 inner city kids in Miami from failing schools. They built this aircraft from scratch in a record 10 weeks, and we flew it on its first flight. For high school students, <laughs> on the left-hand side, 
You see, Bakari, when she started with me, she couldn't point out a sixteenth of an inch on a ruler, much less a half an inch on a ruler. She's now in her final year on a full scholarship as a math major at Duke University. <laughs> Young man on the right-hand side, it took him two hours to figure out how to turn on a vacuum. <laughs> he thought the red button on the vacuum meant do not touch. <laughs> Now he's disarming high-level bombs for the military, and he's alive and well doing it every other day. I then said to myself, there's no way a high schooler shouldn't know where half an inch is on a ruler. So I started working with middle schoolers and upper, upper elementary school students, and I challenged them to build me a car faster than a Ferrari 430 Spider. This was the car that they built. Ferrari 430 Spider, zero to 60, in 3.3 seconds. These students built a car that does it in 2.7 to 2.9 seconds. So here I am. I'm not a certified educator, but it's something that I've become, I've, I've gotten to love. And I said, well, the issue isn't that children can't learn. The issue is they're not engaged to want to learn. So in understanding that, even for me as a professional, being a pilot, one of the things they do is they simulate certain situations you will come across. And my nonprofit organization, Experience Aviation, we had a tremendous amount of success simulating different things where you use math and science in order to achieve a common goal. Well, that's great for those students who were able to participate in my program, but how can you help others on a global scale? That's when I decided I wanted to change the way in which we engage children, and we decided to transform this business jet into a real-life magic school bus that we call the Flying Classroom. Now, the Flying Classroom, what we go out and do is we travel to all continents and we conduct land, air, and sea expeditions that we prepackage for educators in order to help them teach math and science and make it more engaging in the classroom. There's a curriculum that's designed around this without the teacher themselves having to be a subject matter expert. That's my co-pilot, Tom. We fly at an altitude of 45,000 feet. At that altitude, you start to see the darkness of space meet our atmosphere, as well as the curvature of the Earth. Also at that altitude, if we had rapid decompression, we would only have one to three seconds to put on an oxygen mask before we pass out. You see, these are the things kids like. Things that go fast, you could blow up, <laughs> and you could die. We tested out the flying classroom last year. And in our first year, we traveled through North America, Asia, Australia, and Indonesia. And we conducted 16 different expeditions. In conducting these expeditions, we try to find subject matter that teachers struggle to communicate with in their classroom. This is my dear friend, Rob Greenfield. Teachers wrote into us and said, we want you to highlight food waste as well as bacteria. Well, our team said, there's no better way to introduce that than dumpster diving. We spent 48 hours eating out of dumpsters in San Diego, and within our first hour, we found close to 500 pounds of food from four dumpsters. The average grocery store in the United States throws out 200 to 500 pounds of food each and every single day. Now, what, what are students doing with this information? We now have students who are researching how much food does the school waste and creating change around that. Now, did we do anything special? Not necessarily. What happened? We created purpose and a why behind Okay, the science of bacteria, as well as trying to solve a problem. Here's another example. What you're looking at here, we did at the headquarters of Nike. That's not just any shoe. That's a 3D printed shoe. Well, why highlight 3D printing in this way? I wanted students to understand 3D printing is more than a cool thing to do. It's an industry. Nike has figured out a way where no longer you will have to buy a brand new pair of shoes from a department store. You will be able, very soon, to 3D print a brand new pair of shoes at home on a 3D printer and walk out of your house with them on your feet. 
What kid wouldn't care about math and science after seeing something like this? Here's another example that we did in Palau. This is with the sea snake. This creature bites you within the first 45 minutes. You will not have the strength to breathe. Now here's footage that we captured of a sea snake eating an eel that's twice its size. Scientists have been able to prove there's a genetic arms race between the sea snake as well as the eel. What they've been able to prove is that with each and every single birth, the venom from the sea snake is slowly getting stronger, as well as the resistance from the eel is getting stronger as well. Now notice at this point, the eel is not dead. It is paralyzed. The venom has disconnected the signal from the brain to its nervous system. I'll let you watch the sea snake finish its meal here. It was at this point when we were filming, I was tapping everyone on the shoulder like a brother gotta go. We gotta get out of here, right? What I did not realize is that the sea snake was simply burping. It wasn't barking at us, it was burping because it spends half its time on land and half its time in the ocean. So it just swallowed something so massive, it's taking the time to burp. Now, what we're doing here is, this is my friend Zoltan, and we're taking blood directly from the heart of the snake, the sea snake. What scientists have been able to figure it out is that between altering the venom as well as the DNA, the same way in which that toxin can turn off the signal from the brain to the, to the nervous system, you can turn the switch back on in the opposite direction. And you can utilize this to fight against heart attacks, heart disease, diabetes, and other ailments that human beings have. These are the type of things a flying classroom introduces to students. Remember, it's the purpose behind the math and science that makes kids care. When I was in school, I was never motivated to care about math and science. As a matter of fact, we have an expedition that we did that focused on Newton's laws and Bernoulli's principles and gravity. I'll let you guys take a quick watch of it. with a dear friend of mine, Sean Tucker. He's the world's number one aerobatic pilot that flies the Oracle airplane. So that's just a short clip of how we use math and science to engage students. Remember, learning doesn't have to be boring or unmotivating. We can make it fun, and kids are just like adults. If they're not engaged, well, they won't be motivated to take math and science seriously. Thank you all very much. <laughs>